Hey everyone, welcome to today's uh, panel discussion on launching a successful virtual peer-to-peer -peer campaign. Sorry, I'm already looking over here to my other screen where I've got some of my notes and things like that. So um, I, uh, I appreciate everyone being here today and taking a little bit of time out of your day to uh, hear from our panelists. I'm really excited to have these guys along. Uh, I know they all have a lot, a, a ton of experience in either running peer-to-peer -peer campaigns, working with software, and helping people get peer, uh, successful peer-to-peer -peer campaigns up and running. So we're going to just dive right in today. And so before we get going, I want to just go around and give everybody uh, an opportunity to introduce themselves really quickly. And um, and then we'll just dive right into the content. So um, Krista, why don't we start with you? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Krista, and I'm an implementation manager at Classy. Uh, I've been there for almost a year now, and I've worked with over 200 nonprofits uh, for their first two to three months on the platform, giving them one-on-one -on -one sessions in training and strategic support as they use the Classy fundraising suite to build and launch successful campaigns, including peer-to-peer -peer campaigns. And I'm currently hosting weekly group training sessions on using peer-to-peer -peer campaigns specifically uh, in response to uh, the current times and to help uh, nonprofits transition their in-person events to virtual settings. All right, thanks, Krista. Kate, what about you? Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Bruner Quinn. I'm the president of Philanthropy Solutions. We help our nonprofit clients focus on four key areas: fundraising, engagement, events, and tech. I have been a fundraiser, both political and nonprofit, for. 14 years now, um, and thanks for having me. Thanks, Amen. Kate. Hi, my name is Chris Hammond. I'm the CEO and founder of Corporate Giving Connection. Uh, we focus on strategic advising and day-to-day -day execution support um, in marketing and fundraising for small to mid-sized nonprofits. And we love to do peer-to-peer -peer fundraising for our clients centered around uh, end of year giving um, and spring campaigns as well. Awesome, thanks guys. And um, if you've been on a webinar before, you probably uh, know who I am, but my name is Bradley Martin. I lead the marketing efforts here at Kindful. And if you're not familiar with Kindful, we are a fundraising and donor platform that serves over 2000 nonprofit organizations. Um, so as we mentioned today, we're gonna be talking about peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Um, and specifically today, because we are, you know, still on, it's what, April 23rd, 2020, right? And we are still in the middle of, you know, um, the the uh, social distancing, stay-at-home orders all across the United States due to the COVID-19 um, outbreak. And so today we're going to be very much focused on how to launch virtual peer-to-peer -peer campaigns, because since events aren't necessarily happening right now, and many people have had to cancel their events. I know we have seen multiple organizations take what was their in-person event and use a peer-to-peer -peer event um, or a virtual peer-to-peer -peer, uh, campaign, I would say, to maybe replace that event or to replace uh, try, uh, attempt to replace the fundraising effort of that event. And so our goal today is really to focus on um, that virtual element of peer-to-peer Peer and how you would go about creating a successful one. Um, right as all of the COVID uh, stuff was kind of spinning up and really, and we started to really understand we were going to go under a quarantine situation back mid March, we served 700 nonprofit professionals and we asked them, you know, uh, a lot of questions. And one of them was around events. And one of the things that stood out was uh, that we asked them, how are you going to raise funds um, instead of having your event? And a large portion of those people who had already canceled event had mentioned peer-to-peer. -peer. So we haven't really done a session directly on this yet. So we felt like it was a really good time for us just to back up a little bit and have a quick conversation about if you're still searching for some ways to, to raise funds, to create some campaigns that might be unique or different or just aren't a direct appeal, we felt like this would be a good topic to cover. And we also think that as we go forward, a lot of these things, um, I, I I was talking to someone the other day who just made the comment I thought was really great about, um, you know, really the best practices around how to how to fundraise well haven't gone away, right? And so a lot of the things we're going to be talking about today are going to be best practices today and in the future. So 
So let's dive in. So what we're going to do is we've kind of got a line of questions here that we're going to be going through, um, you know, to start off maybe for the first half or so of the hour. And then um, for all of you that are here live and attending with us, we definitely want your questions. And so if you go over to your GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see a tab that says questions. You can drop your question there anytime throughout. You don't have to wait till the end when there's questions. And our team um, uh, is actually going to be compiling those questions and we'll be looking for themes. Last thing I wanna say um, is that this is being recorded today and we will share the recording likely tomorrow after the fact. And we'll ask the panelists if they have any resources or anything that they want us to share out as well. Um, but just know that a recording is coming. So if we're moving too fast, you can't get the notes down, you'll be able to rewatch it. As of you guys, let's kind of dive in. Um, and I'm gonna start with maybe a really uh, simple question but I think it's important for us to kind of level set and start. And that's just, um, what is peer to peer? I'm going to start with Kate and obviously she was the main question, but I'd love for each of you to add where you've seen peer used most successfully and even more specifically, how can you use it successfully now where we're in a situation where we can't gather due to social distancing? So Kate, um, do you want to kind of start us off and talk about a little bit about, you know, just what is a peer to peer campaign um, and, you know, what you're seeing be successful now? Sure, absolutely. So I'm sure everyone has heard of crowdfunding, GoFundMe, Kickstarter, all of those things that you'll see in your social media feed. Peer to peer fundraising is essentially just a multi tiered or a multi level uh, approach to crowdfunding that is really primarily and I think only used by nonprofits. It's a fancier way for saying that you have a way for individuals to create campaigns to fundraise on your organization or cause's behalf, and they can share that fundraiser that they're doing with their friends and family, their community, their network. Um, probably one of the easiest examples of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising are the Facebook fundraisers that we've all seen and given to because someone donates their birthday or something like that. Um, some of the most successful peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaigns are, um, there's a local organization here in Columbus, Ohio, where I live. It is called Pelotonia. In 12 years since it was founded, it has launched, it has raised just under $210 million for um, cancer research. And I highly suggest go check out what they have on their website and look through their tools and different things like that. Um, it's just really smart. Um, it's had a great following for a lot of reasons, but you know, a lot of organizations now are taking these peer-to-peer -peer things um, online because the events are not happening. Some things I've seen that have been really helpful is um, if you are an organization that is maybe has like a health focus, um, for example, uh, Girls on the Run, it's a national program. They have something called Soulmates. You can um, have somebody commit to walk some miles, friends or family donate to miles. I also recently saw um, someone hosted a virtual game night with friends and family and asked for donations in return for attending the virtual game night. Right. Um, so Chris, what, uh, you know, what do you have to add to that? What do you, you know, um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. So, so when I first got started in fundraising, um, you know, my, my more traditional uh, realm of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising was more in the run walks world. Um, you know, I, I, I really loved the idea of the competition that you could get from the team model and having a team captain that has some sort of incentives, whether it is just getting shout outs on social media or actually getting a prize. Um, I loved that concept because I felt that it was much more of a community aspect that you could bring uh, rather than the traditional fundraising model. And what I've really liked is a lot of people that were dependent on run walks have really made that switch to doing the virtual 5Ks, which I think are still, you still have a lot of those same sort of principles where uh, you can have that team captain, you can still have that community feel, you can still uh, really incentivize and give people um, shout outs when, they, when, they've, when they've surpassed their fundraising goals. But for us and our clients, uh, more often than not, we do the bulk of our peer-to-peer -peer fundraising surrounding Giving Tuesday and end of year giving. So we've always looked at this as, as something where, uh, you know, most organizations want to have some sort of impact on Giving Tuesday, but we felt that 
rather than just focusing all our efforts on strictly giving Tuesday, we wanted to have this always be the kickoff of a campaign. So we would focus on recruiting volunteers or board members and making sure that we could put together uh, two parallel campaigns where the organization has a clear communication strategy, whether it be from email and social media and direct mail, but also making sure that fundraisers had that same sort of uh, messaging that's taking place. So we were having two segments of people driven to the same peer-to-peer -peer fundraising page. You still had the competition, you still have the, the competitive atmosphere and, and the, uh, the overall community aspect, but it also gives you the opportunity to really share your message and, and, and provide storytelling to two very different bases of people. So that's something that we've always loved doing and we really feel that in this current climate, really using that virtual peer-to-peer -peer type of model where it's not so much focused on an event, but more the storytelling aspect, there's no better time to do that than now. Right. And Krista, what, you know, over at Classy, what are you guys seeing that, you know, is working really well right now? Or, you know, can you add a little bit more about the types of peer-to-peer -peer campaigns? Yeah, definitely. Um, as far as the current climate and time-based appeals leading up to a perhaps day of virtual event, or otherwise a running in solidarity type um, feature to uh, go against a otherwise in-person run. Uh, I think one of the most important things to note is it allows you to break down what otherwise would have been geographical barriers that would have prevented a larger base of individuals from attending that in-person gala or otherwise attending a walk that you have at a local level. Uh, you're really expanding your reach by allowing people to participate no matter where they are. Um, and beyond that, from a sustainable source of revenue year round, uh, having, as Kate touched on, an evergreen campaign uh, that's a do it yourself in nature. Uh, you can have it all year round. People can choose how long they want to fundraise for, what style resonates with them most, whether that's hosting a, a bake sale or uh, running, committing to a certain amount of uh, steps or miles ran. Uh, just a great way to kind of keep that effort going all year round, uh, in addition to having those time-based appeals. And, and one thing I wanted to add that I, that I somewhat left out, I also think that there's really a great opportunity for people that have had uh, COVID-19 really changing uh, the dynamic of your organization, whether it's school is canceled uh, or, or your, your you know, sporting event has been canceled or something of that nature that can be a whole campaign. You could talk about the fact that the impact that it's had on your, on your base, that they're no longer able to participate in something that they love. You can really develop a, a very clear storytelling and have clear messaging that really talks about the impact that that's made. And you can really, you can rally, rally the people around that. Um, that's great. And um, Kate, we had, we had a lot of people ask, as you mentioned it, um, what was the name of that that website again? Was it pelotonia.org? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna send that out. You should find it as a, a, a answer in the questions there uh, if you're attending right now. Um, I I, th I think all that's great. Um, you know, and it's great information. I think you know. I do. One of the things that stands out to me. I do think that. Um, uh, we're so used to peer-to-peer -peer campaigns being attached to an event um and like and kate you mentioned um that you, um uh sorry i just literally lost my thought as i was talking <laughs> which is uh, insane but i'm um, sorry but um but you know i think there's or you mentioned some evergreen campaigns right and stuff and stuff like that but i do think right now I think you know we we might want to think about peer-to-peer -peer campaigns just slight differently in the way of that understanding that it is an awesome way to help use your current constituents to get to their networks, right? And and Krista, to your point, that it really can break down geographical borders if you think about it just a little bit differently. And so I think we've we've really been kind of stuck thinking through about you know that these things are tied to events or they're tied to a uh, a date or something like that and i think you can think a little bit broadly or more broadly right um so let's let's continue forward here um and get into kind of you know a couple other topics so um 
I wanted to jump into, you know, we kind of hit on this a little bit, but if you had to like give like a little bit, almost a blueprint, like what are the key elements to a successful peer-to-peer -peer campaign, right? So um, obviously launching a successful peer-to-peer uh, -peer campaign has many different elements um, that all need to work together to make it successful. So I wanted to just kind of go around and Chris, we'll start with you on this one, but what are those elements? And are there some that are more important than others in your mind? Um, because, you know, I I don't think a peer-to-peer -peer -peer campaign, just being frank and honest, is quite as easy as just a straight straightforward appeal, right? It takes a little bit more thought. So what's your thoughts there, Chris? Yeah, no, Bradley, I think you're, I think you hit, you hit the nail right on the head. I think that they're one of the biggest uh, common misconceptions that I've seen is some people uh, believe that just, hey, I'm creating a peer-to-peer -peer campaign and the people will come. Um, I think it takes quite a bit of work to, to really build out a plan before you've actually kicked off that campaign. So one of the top things that I think is very important is having a great campaign theme. Having a compelling theme that you can rally your stories, have your testimonials, have your collateral all speak to, um, and 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 that goes back to what I was talking about in this in this particular occasion. It could be uh, you know school has been canceled. You can talk about so many different stories of how that's impacted the different students that were going to that school. Um, and then that next piece to me is making sure that you've taken the time to put together those compelling testimonials. Um, or any sort of stories that will get, you know, evoke that emotion that is needed to get donors to give. Um, but I think maybe the most important piece for me personally is, uh, A, it's important to have that, that, that strong messaging and, 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 and a strong communication plan so that there is some sort of a, a, a calendar that's taking place. But the thing that I, I, I say, if you, if you don't even have any of those things, if you have strong templates, that is going to be the key to success. I feel that so so many peer-to-peer -peer campaigns are driven through your fundraisers, and I think it's imperative to provide them with a fundraising kit where they can have access to collateral, have access to email templates, and have access to social media templates that are speaking in the same way that the organization is speaking about themselves, um, and making sure that you're not having your fundraise ha fundraisers have to recreate the wheel. It's more fill in the blank and making sure that they can hit the ground running and get this messaging out to their community rather than having to be the ones that create the messaging themselves. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think there's some really, really good points there around messaging. Um, so Christo, you know, what, what do you see kind of from being on the platform side of what really makes a successful peer-to-peer -peer campaign? Yeah, absolutely, Bradley. And just to kind of piggyback off of uh, Chris's message about having a strong marketing campaign, I mean, your fundraising effort is only going to be as strong as the level of engagement and promotion you're doing with your supporters. Um, but from coming from the software side of things, having an intuitive, easy to use tool for your supporters to actually be able to create their fundraising pages, uh, have all of that email messaging, the design tools, everything in one place, that they can very easily put that page together and be proud of what they're sharing uh, with their friends, family, and external uh, support network at, at wide, um, and having the nonprofit have those fundraising toolkits that they're providing to them in addition to that easy to use tool. Um, it's just imperative for them to be able to easily set up a page um, and not have to deal with a super complex or clunky um, software or website that they would be using to design and share these pages. Great. And Kate, I know you've had a lot of experience doing these as an actual fundraiser, you know, in organizations. I mean, I know we've all had some experience with it, but um, you you probably have a little bit of a different insight just being the person that's actually trying to, that you've got the dollar on your head kind of thing of like, I've got this goal to meet and a budget to meet. So what yeah. are kind of your thoughts from that angle a little bit? So, yeah, I, that's so funny. You took the words out of my mouth because I was going to say, I think my perspective is just a little bit different. And I would say, um having launched fundraising campaigns from the inside and doing peer-to-peer -peer, whether they're event-based or they're um more evergreen campaigns as krista called it earlier i think there are five key points to launching a successful virtual um or you know peer-to-peer -peer campaign number one it needs to be fun it needs to be unique 
it needs to have some kind of good connection with your um, organization. I mentioned Girls on the Run before. Um, it's a fabulous organization that I worked at for several years. They have something called Soulmates, S-O-L-E Mates, and it's very specific to their organization and it's unique and it does really well. Um, the next, the, you know, number two, I would say create a launch team. Have a team of folks ready to go who are going to help you kick off the peer-to-peer -peer initiative, whether that is um, volunteers or like um, donors who maybe want to get involved in a deeper level, board members, even staff can do it too, whoever, but have a launch team ready to go so you're not just like flipping a switch and going, okay, we're turning this on and see what happens. Um, I think number three to echo what Krista and Chris were saying, you 100% need to make it easy to set up. Um, I really think it should be something that they can do in two minutes or less. Um, I think, you know, we live in a 40 second world and, um, you know, people don't want to do anything that's going to be too complicated. Like Chris said, absolutely provide tools, sample solicitation letters, social media toolkits, fundraising ideas, calendars. Um, a couple other fun things I've done is I've actually created custom links and redirects. So maybe if you go to kindful.com slash Bradley, you would go right to their campaign. Um, I've also used text to give as part of the toolkit and created like a text to Bradley to 54555 and you get a link to donate right to their campaign because you, know, you wanna just make it as easy as possible for people. And then the fifth thing that's really important Steward your fundraisers and create some affinity around the group of supporters who are choosing to fundraise for you. So send them updates, create relationships. And it's so important to say thank you early and often. Um, I think incentives are also a huge bonus for this group of fundraisers. Um, maybe you have a donor or an organization who will agree to give some discounts or something for free to this group of people, um, you know, just as like an incentive and a thank you for doing this for your organization. I, sorry, I think all those are great, I, um, and and I do think it just illustrates that, um, and what I heard as a theme through all of your answers is peer-to-peer -peer campaigns, they can be highly successful, and they can really give you what I like to think of as a lot of leverage through your current constituents, but to say that they're easy probably isn't something that you would say, right? Like they're we have tools that can make it easier, right? And you should think about those tools. And, and I wanna dive a little bit into that. A lot of you have asked about what's the right software to use and stuff like that. And I think the tough answer is it depends, but I think we can give you guys some recommendations. Um, but we've already kind of started to, to it a little bit, but I wanna go a little bit deeper on recruiting the fundraisers that are raising your behalf, right? And, um, you know, I think it's one of the biggest challenges with launching this successful peer-to-peer -peer campaign is recruiting your donors or constituents to participate in the first place, right? So what what are your tips and tricks? I think like the idea of like providing some incentives or, you know, and things like that. But, and then also we've had a couple of questions already kind of roll in around um, how many do you need? Like how many fundraisers and like does that matter like you know how do you think about that like especially when you think about the amount you're trying to raise right so like and i mean i know that's probably a little bit of a vague question and probably the thing that's so tough about answering anything like this is that i think it always comes down to a key word is it well it depends on on your organization on your goal and your constituents and, and all the stuff but but can we can we start with krista you know and then then kind of work around to kate and chris I'd love to just get you guys' thought on how do you go about recruiting these fundraisers, team leads, et cetera, and how do you um, keep them and get them really excited to go raise funds on behalf of your organization? Yeah, definitely. So uh, as far as a starting point, I think going in with a realistic goal uh, so that your supporters off the bat don't feel like how on earth are we going to even accomplish this uh, individual fundraising goal and collective goal that's been set forth. Uh, and from there, just having a very clear ask uh, to them, I think now more than ever, uh, being mindful of uh, the increase in economic uncertainty, uh, job insecurity that your supporters may be feeling, uh, to really start small uh, and 
having a structure perhaps of a give five dollars and recruit five people so that you're not only uh, asking for a small push and granted you can you know uh, switch up those numbers depending upon what your current donors generally give as a baseline uh, maybe lowering that a little bit uh, given uh, the current climate and then from there not only are they giving but you are incentivizing them to recruit others to then join that effort um, and just making it seem way more manageable and realistic for them to be able to contribute and also expanding your uh, reach and increasing the number of new donors and new fundraisers that you're going to get in by having that kind of targeted messaging. Uh, I think what Kate said earlier about having incentives on top of that are really a uh, great tool. Um, and even if you maybe can't give actual uh, chance to win certain prizes, uh, you can always have uh, really honing in on that virtual event model we discussed earlier on. Uh, let's say there's a, a day of event that this is leading up towards. You have a special guest speaker or a performance that you can host over a Zoom meeting or YouTube Live and discern whether or not that'll be a, if you hit X goal amount, you'll be able to unlock this live uh, session, performance, et cetera, or otherwise uh, just simply having that as a, a target for them to be looking forward to on that day of um, and being able to participate in a, uh, in a fashion that makes it feel like you are part of an in-person event, even though all virtual. Um, and lastly, I would say just uh, connecting with them regularly, um, both to be able to increase those number of recruits and keep your current uh, donor base engaged uh, and just making sure that, you know, not too much, uh, but that you have a tactic in place for what your communication strategy to be regularly checking in with them, updating them about milestones um, and percentage of goals that have been hit to keep them engaged and moving forward in their efforts. I think that's great. Um, how about you, Kate? So what I mentioned before is I really think creating that launch team is going to be helpful. And as far as the number that you want to do, it's I would actually tie it to how much you want that person to raise. If you are asking individuals to commit to raising like ten thousand dollars, I probably wouldn't do more than ten because that's going to be a lot to manage. If you're asking them to raise a thousand dollars, maybe you say, you know what, we're going to try to get twenty people on board for this first initiative and raise X, and then kind of take it from there. But I think think about it in terms of how much you want them to raise because that's going to mean how much of your time, staff time, and their time it's going to take. Um, so I think that's kind of like a good way to start. Um, you know, again, I would say creating affinity around the program is really smart. Um, I'm a big believer in examples and looking what other people are doing. Um, I was a regional director for the Make-A-Wish Foundation um, at the largest um, uh, chapter in the United States. And they do this program called Women Inspiring Strength and Hope. And they get a group of 10 plus women to each commit to raise um, $10,000 to grant a wish for a child. And they do a really beautiful job with stewarding those donors, um, you know, events two or three times a year with former like uh, members and new members. Um, it's really, really successful. One of the other things I think is good about kind of getting these people and getting more people in the pipeline and kind of creating this is um, do some really cool stewardship associated with the people who fundraise for you. Um, my experience is really strictly in children's focused charities. So instead of doing a plaque or a, you know, a, something along those lines, um, we've done some really amazing things like a letter or a video from um, a child whose life has been impacted by the funds that person has raised. Um, we've done artwork created by groups of kids and given to that donor along with a letter um, because you know everybody has plaques, but like that would be something cool to hang in your office or your home and kind of have forever. Um, so I just think like anything that you can do to kind of make it something that people want to do and has a really meaningful connection with your your mission is good. I, I also, you know, in the times that are not coronavirus, um, you know, some kind of like lunch or dinner, um, you know, just some kind of thank you, even event uh, can be really nice. But, you know, right now, I would say if you want to find those people, go with who already supports you don't you know you, you're you don't need to go do this like cast a huge net, a wide net you probably look pretty closely and ordinarily i'd say go get coffee go to lunch go do something like that but you know have a phone call schedule a zoom meeting be authentic and see what they're interested in right chris what uh, do you think 
Yeah, and, and, and so first off, I, I, I fully agree with what Kate and Krista were saying about uh, making sure that you have you know, realistic goals um, and making sure that you're developing, you're, you're creating a team that, that, that can hit that goal rather than just saying, hey, I want to have 50 fundraisers just for the sake of it. Um, one thing that I do look at a lot of times is when we're working with our clients, uh, you know, they, they, they always default decide that they want their board members to be the fundraisers for their peer to peer campaign. Um, and, and, and one of the big things that I like to say is I, I, I don't partic particularly think that board members, some board members are perfect for a campaign, but I don't necessarily think just because they're your board member, they're going to be a great fundraiser. Um, what I, what I like to look at is I have a few different, uh, favorite fundraiser types. So I look for individual donors who have given consistently. I think I'm a big believer. And if they've shown that consistency, that's maybe somebody that would be a little bit more accountable. Um, committee members with a tr track record of accountability, uh, dependable volunteers with an active network. If you have board members who have been consistent in accomplishing their fundraising goals, I think that they can be a really nice fit or any individuals, I, I know we've all received that, that email before where you have an individual who might not have um, you know, a lot to give from a money perspective, but they are, uh, they've expressed interest in getting more involved. I always feel that it's important to have those type of exploratory conversations with them. But another piece that I've really you know, started to depend on more so is making sure that you can, if you have the flexibility to do this, having just a brief uh, interview process with a potential fundraiser. And I don't, I don't necessarily think it should be an interview, but more so, uh, you know, having just a few questions that provide clarity on what their role actually is going to be. I think it's important to ask them, are you open to soliciting funds from your network through email and social media? People sign up for, to, to be a part of a campaign and they don't really understand what it entails. Um, I think it's very, very important to ask them, you know, point blank, are you comfortable with fundraising X amount of dollars over X amount of time? And if you're not able to hit that, would you, would you still make sure that we could hit that goal? Um, and then lastly, an, another one that I really like to do is just, will you, we're going to provide you with these templates. Are you going to share these templates with your, with your network? I think these, these ideas really work on two ends. I think it gives them a clear understanding of what they're getting involved in. But if somebody decides that they're sending out, you know, random messaging that is not in line with what you had put together to begin with, you can point back to that original conversation. So I think, as, as Krista was saying earlier, I think it's so important to continue um, coaching and checking in um, and making sure that they're staying motivated throughout the process because they don't need to do this. They are helping you out. And I think it's important that you have to be mindful of their time. And I think by having that fundraising kit for them, you're being mindful of their time, but also coaching them along the way. So you can say, hey, I noticed you, 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 you tried this message out. Maybe we should shift a little bit. If you can have that relationship, I think that they're going to appreciate um, how important this is to you and also still being mindful of their time. Wow. Now, I really have to say, I mean, you guys have just given so much great information in this one section of this conversation. Um, and there's so many questions I want to ask, um, but <laughs> but um, I don't know that we have, you know, a ton of time for all of it. I do want to say, I want to ask one question because I know a lot of our audience is in this situation, right? So if we, if maybe we can just do like kind of a quick fire drill around the, 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 the order again. If you're a small organization, right, and you only have, let's just say, just for uh, you know, example, say two full-time employees, right? Uh, but you have like some really, really great donors who love your organization, and you're looking for a way, let's just say, to raise five thousand extra dollars, right, or something like that, like you know that that you don't have a hundred thousand dollar goal, you don't have a hundred thousand dollar goal. But like you've got a need right now that if you could get five, ten, fifteen thousand, like is a peer-to-peer -peer campaign, first off, is it worth it for those kind of goals? And number two, what would be the simplest version of a quick or is there a quick peer-to-peer -peer campaign? I guess that's what I'm kind of getting into because I feel like 
we've got organizations, you know, that I know uh, engage with a lot of our companies. They're probably on here today that may, their whole budget may be $100,000 or even less, right? Or, or $250,000. How do you guys think about peer-to-peer -peer for organizations like that? Um, Kate, you want to kick us off on this and then we'll just, we'll go around Kate, Krista, and Chris. Sure. So has someone who has been a development or advancement team of one before and um, was, you know, just kind of getting through it day in and day out and doesn't have a lot of time or anything like that. I would say that I think if you need to quickly raise that kind of money, I would first and foremost look at your database and see if there are donors that you can just go to and have a conversation with. I would say if you need to do something quickly and like are kind of hoping for things to turn around, your best bet is to have a conversation. I think a really good peer-to-peer -peer campaign and one that will truly be successful long term you have to put time into it. And, and if you don't have the time, do you have an advancement committee, a marketing committee, a development committee? Do you have volunteers who you could say, you know what, could you help me get this off the ground? Here's what I wanna do, here's what I wanna create and go from there. Um, so that, that's what I would say. Okay, Krista, what do you think? Yeah, um, I, I think piggybacking off of uh, Kate's mention of going to your current donor base, uh, I think a huge incentive both for individuals to give and also to make it more feasible for perhaps people who may fall into that larger donor bucket, uh, high value donors or even companies, um, having some kind of sponsor program set up. So there's a matching sponsor. So let's say your ask of a company or individuals to give 1500 instead of 3000 and having your donors uh, giving them that messaging that there's a generous sponsor that's going to match half of that uh, match up to $1,500, so that way you're doubling your impact, giving more incentive to your donors to give during that uh, time crunch period, and also making it less of an ask to those specific individuals or companies. I also agree with Kate that you need to put time into it, even if you don't have the uh, internal administrative capabilities to do so, having it run for not just a day uh, or even a week, uh, maybe two weeks to a month being like a peak period if you are on a semi-time crunch, but really giving your fundraisers the ability to go out and do that uh, crowdfunding amongst their support networks, as you definitely uh, will have a little more difficulty making that meet, meeting that same impact uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion if you're keeping it to a day uh, or even a week period. What do you and think, then, Chris? Yeah, and, I, I, and once again, you know, I would agree with Kate and Krista on this. I don't necessarily think it's something that you would want to put together a full-fledged campaign. Um, the one thing that I would add to it is I, I do believe that you can use some of the principles of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising um, and, and rally it around. You could easily rally this around. For, for example, if you had somebody that's an annual donor that gives about $1,000 a year, I love the idea of, of, of the match concept of just saying to you know hey we want you you know that you're going to give a thousand dollars this year we i'm going to give you some templates that you can just send out to your friends and and, and family and see if you can you know incentivize them and say hey i'm giving a thousand dollars will you guys help me get to the point where we can get five thousand um still have that storytelling of what where is this money going towards why do we need it um, but i i can still provide them with the social templates the email templates for them to do it and they can still do they can just do the press send portion of it but i think it is if you have a few people in your network that were already planning to give anyway um and you and you're you're wanting to, to give now and really uh share the messaging with their with their group i think you can do that immediately and I don't think you have to build out a full-fledged campaign for that. But I, I think there should be some select individuals that you already have in place that you feel if you need to call on them for that, um, that you can you can rely on them in that in that short, quick time frame. Yeah, I, I think all that's so great. And I think you guys have kind of um, started to highlight a little bit that that I think there's a distinction between a full-fledged peer-to-peer campaign and a crowdfunding campaign. Right. And I think like really think what we're talking about a little bit you have a campaign with a goal um but you're not necessarily like you could set up a, a campaign with a goal and send that out to your whole database if you wanted to and said hey like we've really got this really um you know uh particular need or opportunity um and we'd love for you not only to give but even if you can't give right now share with your network and see if anyone could help us um 
be able to, and, and that to me is more of a crowdfunding opportunity versus, you know, a truly fully fledged peer to peer. Um, and I think people kind of get those confused sometimes, right? Um, and so I think that's a good distinction. Um, so let's see here. Um, so I want to I want to end kind of this section, um, and and we've answered a, quite a bit of the questions kind of throughout, and so. I think we've taken care of quite a few of the questions, but we still have uh, quite a few more to go to. But I want to ask, like, as part of a peer to peer campaign, um, hopefully what's going to happen is you're going to get a, quite a few new donors, right? You're going to get donors who maybe this is the first time they've ever been introduced to your organization. And I, I'm going to be a little bold here and maybe say that they aren't necessarily in some cases. Right. They may not be giving to your organization so much because they are like 100 percent compelled by your work, but they were compelled by a friend. Right. A friend said, hey, I would really love your help helping me hit this goal. Right. Versus when you have someone come direct to you who is so compelled by your mission to give. And so my question to you guys is. If we think about it kind of through that lens a little bit, then how do you. How do you cultivate those donors who are the result of a successful peer-to-peer -peer campaign a little differently than you might um, cultivate a, uh, a direct donor? And so, Kate, what do you think about that? So let me say this. I'm going to answer this question for you from the shoes of someone who is a really small team, and maybe you don't have a lot of resources at your disposal, and you don't have a lot of staff and things like that. So um, uh, and I'll touch on what you talked about, Bradley, because that was actually one of the points I wanted to make. Um, first and foremost, and I just can't stress this enough, you need to say thank you early and often. I know that we always say this and it seems so basic, but you know, I, I give to a number of nonprofits and I can't tell you how many either forget to say thank you or just do so really, really slowly. And again, I've been in those shoes before where you are just churning the work out and you're trying to get it all done and you have a million things on your plate. So, you know, but enlist help. So, and one of the ways I like to do that is I like to call, I like to create what I call a stewardship squad. And it can be a group of volunteers, staff, board members, even individuals who are like, um, just have been impacted by your mission to help you say thank you. Um, and make those thank yous personal, make it timely. It can be a call, an email, a handwritten note. Again, it just needs to be personal and timely. Something I've encouraged my teams to do, and Kindful was a really great tool to use this with because of their ability to schedule reports. Um, we would schedule reports to go every morning to people's email, and they would get a report saying who they needed to thank that day. And it was their call to figure out how they wanted to thank them, but it was a great way you started your day with 10 minutes of gratitude, which is a really great way to set the tone for the day. I mean, you're just, it's, it's really a win-win. Um, I would say those new donors that end up in your database, keep in touch before you ask them for another donation. Think about ways you can keep involved. Um, can you connect with them personally? Does it make sense for them to kind of go in a portfolio? Um, or are they more of an annual fund donor? Um, can you connect with them on social media? Um, can you invite them to an event, to volunteer? Um, maybe it's someone that you've been trying to make a connection with and maybe they could even be a possible board member. Um, stuff that I've done in the past that's always been really helpful is having in place um, like a new donor email welcome series where they get, you know, all of these things in a series. Um, and I would say, you know, creating a stewardship plan, if it's not something you can do internally, it is a great project for a development or an advancement committee. And then, you know, to kind of touch on what Bradley said is that exactly what he said, a lot of these people are giving because they gave to the to help the person that they have a relationship with the fundraiser. So if you don't have time to, or you don't get a great response, don't be disheartened, just keep going forward. And then again, really remember to say thank you and don't forget to you know, really focus on the people who are actually doing the fundraising for you. So great. Um, Chris, what do you think about on this topic? Uh, First off, I want to thank Kate for saying welcome series. I think that's one of the most important pieces. If you're going to bring somebody into your network that, you know, like you said, they, they were likely giving because their peer told them to, I think a welcome series is, is so important. It gives, it gives a nice organic uh, way of 
teaching them about your organization. And you can really uh, segment these different emails so that you can have one that talks a little bit about the background of the organization, maybe one talking about the impact that you're making in the community, one that talks about your programs. I, I think this is so important because it gives a nice opportunity for you to have uh, a, a touch point without actually making any sort of ask. Uh, but but typically for us, what we what we try to tell our clients is, you know, right after the donation is made, uh, they should receive that automatic thank you. But within a month, they should receive that that thank you letter from the organization itself. Once that has happened, uh, they should be entered into receiving those welcome series of emails. And if you have a newsletter list, that's also just a great way for them to join. I feel that you should be having at least five touch points before you've had any sort of, uh, you know, real communication of what the next steps are of your relationship that you're building. Uh, but I, but I think the welcome series is really helpful on, on 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 two ends. I think it's a educating, but b you can you can review the engagement. You can look back. Are they actually opening these emails? Are they clicking on anything? You can look at the analytics and you can see for yourself how engaged are they actually and how uh how much do they actually want to learn about your organization um and then i and then one of my suggestions that i always say is depending on how much they've given um you can decide once they've gone through the welcome series or once they've gone through the email list you can decide how you want to follow up with them in the future whether that is uh, you know, sending a personal note about volunteering or telling about different ways that they, they can engage or if they gave a, a, a large amount, maybe trying to set up an in-person meeting. But I think, you know, really trying to focus on what is the data telling you is super helpful. But I think it's also just think about where you would want to be if you were in, in that donor's shoes. If you just gave to an organization, you wouldn't want to be bombarded with you know, different asks or different messaging. You want this to be organic and you want this to happen over time. So I just always use yourself as, as, as an example so that you're not trying to oversaturate the efforts because that could be a very easy way to get an unsubscribe button. That's great. Krista, what do you think? Yeah, um, I think just kind of honing in on the welcome series a bit more. Um, going in with the expectation, as you mentioned, Bradley, up front, they may not, not know anything about the organization and they're just strictly supporting their friend or family member in their efforts. So not only having a welcome series, but as far as the specific communications, keeping it succinct, high level, what your mission statement is, what specifically your organization supports. And uh, at Classy, we always love suggesting if you have the capabilities to add a short, brief video in there that really highlights your mission. Uh, people love engaging with visuals and being able to paint up front uh, everything that you stand for if they aren't already aware of it without some super bulky uh, content or otherwise ask uh, immediately for more money. Um, and then as far as uh, a previous question that had been asked is uh, growing your fundraiser base. I, I think these individuals could be prime targets for actually trying to recruit into your next peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaign, uh, given that they came in through that channel uh, and being able to encourage them that like their friend or family member whose page they donated on, they too can continually expand that effort uh, by creating their own page and uh, kind of using them, uh, nurturing them for whatever your next peer-to-peer -peer initiative is. I think that's all great. And I wanted to add, uh, Kristen, you already hit on it, but like the idea of using and and, and I'm going to go the, the route of like a very authentic video to say thank you, um, it, especially if you're at a small organization and and you'd say like, I would love to personally thank everybody who came. Right. One of the ways to do that, take your iPhone your Android or whatever. Right. And have your executive director record a brief um, like when I say brief, 30 seconds, right? Thank you. You know, like, and just really, really, um, you know, uh, that is um, real and un feels kind of unscripted, uh, you know, because I think we always get caught up in this idea that like uh, we need to do a really, really um, um, pro job and it needs to be edited and all these things, right? And um, I've learned something through this whole um, situation where we've been with kind of COVID-19 is that that's really not necessary, right? And 
what's necessary is authenticity um, and clarity and gratitude, right? And uh, and I think like those things can go so far, but you know, having a video for someone to click on, like we we are a video society now, right? And so like if if you just think a little bit, if you spend any time on Facebook or Twitter or any of the platforms, you look at like the prolific thing that's happening with TikTok. If you have a kid or anything like that, you probably know about it, right? And like, um, you know, we love video, right? We can't help but to click on a video. So like, yeah, I would just encourage you to think about when you're thinking of use to do a very authentic video that just says, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and then make sure you include that. Where is, you know, what is going to have money that's given? You know, so it's not just supporting your, your friend. Now's your opportunity to turn it into the story about what your what the impact is going to be. Um, so we have nine minutes left, um, and I want to put you guys on the spot. We've answered a lot of the questions. Uh, hit on one that people have asked about a lot: platforms. There's a slew of them, right? You've got two technologies on here that both offer peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer, uh, and crowdfunding resources. That's both classy and kindful. Um, Krista, you can tell me if you think I'm wrong with this, you know, uh, ex explanation. Kindful does pretty, um, I, and I'm going to just say like pretty basic but effective peer-to-peer -peer campaigns, right? You're able to launch an, an effective but basic class can also do the ba the basic, but also can do very integrated, fully, you know, uh, much, much more well-designed. Um, you know, they, they've got a lot more tools that bring all these items together. So like, you know, uh, uh, leaderboards, tie it with a, uh, um, uh, overall campaign and all on one beautiful landing page. And so, you know, if you're looking for something a little bit more, um, robust, um, and, um, and, uh, customizable, I would definitely, uh, consider you look at, uh, classy, um, kindful is peers integrated full on with our donor management system. You can take a look at us as well, but there's a, there's a slew of tools out there, right? So, um, our goal today is not really to sell software, it's to talk about how to do some of this. But put you guys on the spot about, it. we've got um, Giving Tuesday now coming up, right, on May 5th, right? I think from what I heard you guys say today um, is that you probably couldn't launch an effective peer-to-peer, full-on peer-to-peer campaign today for Giving Tuesday now. Like, I'm feeling that way, right? Um, but if you're, I think there's a lot of people on this thing that are looking for a little bit of urgency and looking for some opportunities to do something quick. And so I know this might not be completely peer to peer focused, but if each of you were at an organization and you were tasked today to come up with a Giving Tuesday Now campaign that helped use your constituents to spread your message, right? So what would you do, right? Like what would be your what um because i think there's so many people in that position so i just want to see what you guys what you guys think to that and we'll probably end on that question because we have seven minutes left so why don't we start with chris and then we'll go to krista and then with kate yeah you know so I, I i think first and foremost i think if if you're an organization that has done a peer-to-peer -peer campaign before and you already have templates in place and you already have people um, that have reached out to you, you know, since COVID-19 happened and said, how can I help? How can I help? Or, or even people that have been fundraisers for you before. I do believe that you can put together a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaign. I think you have to have much different expectations on what is going to happen. And I think you have to understand that anything that you raise is going to be gravy. Um, but I think that you can capitalize on the moment of saying, and, and going back to what I talked about before, whether it's an event cancellation, whether your programs have been halted, whether you're not able to serve the same amount of people that you would typically serve, I think you could rally around that. I think you can get your community pretty excited about supporting, uh, you know, something that they can tangibly understand has been affected by COVID-19. I think if you have the templates in place, if you have all those pieces in place, and even if you don't have them in place, I, I think more than anything, everybody has nothing but time to have these con these type of exploratory conversations. And so I think it's worthwhile to have that type of conversation and said, hey, I know that you might not be in a position where you can uh, you know, give a big donation right now, but would you be willing to run a campaign and send this out to your community? 
I think that that's so important right now. And I think that rather than it being such a financial ask, I think as of now, all you're asking for is time. And I think it's worth it to give it a shot. Um, and, and like we said, it might not be the most successful, but I, but I, I don't think it hurts to try. Great. Krista, what yeah, do you think? And I think going back to what we touched on about needing at least some period of time to be hosting a successful peer-to-peer, um, I think you have two options here of either if you do want to go the peer-to-peer -peer route, using this period leading up to May 5th as a soft launch period, um, and then perhaps continuing it onwards, but having that May 5th date be the culminating day or otherwise uh, just the day that you actually fully launch it and then continue to drive that effort forward. Um, using the Giving Tuesday templates, logos, et cetera, on your campaign pages um, and the hashtag that they have to make sure that you can get your uh, as large of a support network as possible during that time. Um, but otherwise, knowing that you can go the route of a crowdfunding campaign, even a general donation form, uh, utilizing that branding and capturing as many donors in the most easy to uh, use way to raise money, simple donation form, um, and being able to just uh, really focus on the time-based crunch of raising funds versus uh, actually uh, having that peer-to-peer -peer be the main part of your strategy there. Great. Kate, what do you think? So it's really timely that you ask this for Giving Tuesday. I actually have a client that um, we're launching a Giving Tuesday Now campaign for them. Um, so we've kind of taken a multi-tier approach and I think it's a good one and one that you can probably turn around and do really quickly. Um, we are putting together a series of emails that will be scheduled and done. We are announcing the Giving Tuesday opportunity one week in advance. We felt that anything more out than that in the current climate that we're in where life is kind of changing minute to minute, um, didn't want to have too big of a lead time to it because I just, ugh, I don't want it to get lost. Um, we have asked a donor if we can use their gift as our matching funds for this opportunity so we let people know in my experience days of giving like giving tuesday giving tuesday now other ones are most successful when people know that their donation is going to be amplified it really motivates people to kind of give immediately um, we've done an entire social media campaign that is echoing the um, email and don't don't let that for the person who is like i'm one person how do i do this that sounds a lot fancier than it is it's just have emails ready to go, have social media posts scheduled, you know, you can do this. And then, you know, the other thing is, um, it's also a great way if you have supporters who maybe can't give right now, maybe they can do their own, like just little fundraiser quickly, whether it's through Classy or Kindful or even a Facebook fundraiser to say, I'm helping to raise money for this organization on Giving Tuesday now, you know, donations will be matched, whatever that is. Um, that's all stuff that you can probably turn around and get done in advance of the May 5th date, which will be here before we know it. That's great. And I'm I'm going to uh, leave leave this topic with one simple comment, and then I'll give kind of some closing opportunity for just a quick closing thoughts. But, um, you know, if you're grappling with the idea that, um, you know, whether or not you should do a Giving Tuesday con, uh, campaign. I'm on a lot of forums, see a lot of people saying, um, you know, uh, should we do one? Is it worth the time? Stuff like that. Here's what I'm, I'm going to break it down to as simple as I know how is um, at minimum, put yourself out there that day. Right. Um, and and I think what I mean by that is like there are going to be it, it's going to don't know if it's going to be as big as a normal giving tuesday we have no idea it's unprecedented we don't know i i would say likely not be just because it doesn't have that much lead time and history to it but we never know it might even be bigger um but there are going to be millions of donors out looking for an opportunity to give right and i think um making sure that you're just even if you just show up in their inbox right with um a very simple message that says we know you have um, many if you weren't well today is giving tuesday now give a little bit of the you can go to uh, giving tuesday's website get a snippet of what it's all about right and then the impact you would do if they gave to your organization we love if you consider giving to us right and then have a dedicated landing page for it with a goal right and i think like if you're not going to do anything else but 
I've, I've been really pushing the idea that I know a lot of people felt really uncomfortable asking people to give during this time. And I understand that, but maybe you don't ask them to give as much as you give them the opportunity to give, right? And so I think that's a really uh, great way. We have seen at Kindful that online giving has doubled and has stayed consistently um, twice as high over the last four weeks is what it has been the first, what, 12 weeks of 2020, right? Which is just amazing, right? Is to see the generosity has not subsided, if anything, it's increased, especially online. Um, so we're a little over, um, so just real quick, any closing thoughts from anybody? Uh, you know, if you if you wanna, um, you know, let people know how to get in touch with, or, you know, uh, what you're up to, stuff like that, would, would love for you guys to do that at this point. Uh, Chris, you wanna start? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think my, my closing thoughts are, I think it's so important to just put your guys' selves out there and just, you know, come up with a sound strategy of your peer-to-peer -peer and making sure that you have people that they've wanted to give and they've wanted to do something, but you you haven't known how to activate them. I think the time is now to use those those individuals um, and, and bring those much needed funds to your to your organization. And uh, you can always you can always find us online cgcgiving.com. Uh, but you know, for us, all we care about is that organizations are out there raising those much needed funds at this at this important time. Right, Krista. Yeah, um, I know from working with nonprofits as they're perhaps launching their first peer-to-peer -peer programs ever or transitioning to a new platform, it can feel like a pretty daunting and overwhelming task. Uh, but just uh, I hope sessions like this are helpful and uh, know that you can always reiterate on the programs that you're running. Um, and as far as Classy directly, uh, even if you're not in the market for new nonprofit software, we have a boatload of resources on our blog uh, to help from both Giving Tuesday Now initiatives, COVID response in general, and all around fundraising strategy. Uh, so you can read more about that on classy.org. So um, first thing I want to say is this is just what a time to be alive, right? I mean, it's uh, <laughs> um, so I so, you know someone said this to me and I think it's really important and I say it to myself all the time. You are not trying to work from home right now. You are working and figuring out life in the middle of a pandemic. So first and foremost, give yourself grace. We've given you a lot of information here and to that person who is a small team, um, you can do this. You know, don't forget to ask for help. You know, try to think of some of those key points that we talked about um, because you 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 can do this. It's not it's maybe not as hard as it sounds. And um, if there's any questions that didn't get answered, um, my email is just kate at philanthropy-solutions.com. I'm happy to answer anybody's questions. Yeah, great. Well, thank you guys so much for taking the time today. I thought it was a really really uh, um, informative session. I think we. A lot of ground and it probably gives a lot of people a lot of stuff to think about um for all of you you that hung on with us three minutes late thank you so much um hope you can stay safe and healthy and you know really hope that uh we're you're able to take just a little bit of this and and uh, apply a little of it to your organization so thanks everyone bye-bye thank you bye thank you, thank you.